Noguera plans to leave Davis sleeping in Seattle. The outlaw promises to treat Johnson like an in-law. And it's the third and final act for Molitor and Endlovu. Welcome to the Fight Network's preview show for all the action this weekend. Hey everybody, it's John Pollock here. Welcome to the Fight Network's preview show. Big show ahead. We're going to be previewing all of the action that's coming up this weekend, including Steve Mulder's title defense in South Africa this Saturday, and his trainer Chris Johnson will be joining us later on in the program. John Ramdean is going to be here as he breaks down UFC Fight Night 24 that takes place this weekend in Seattle, and that card is headlined by light heavyweight action. The main event this Saturday night features light heavyweight action as Team Noguera and Black House product Antonio Hogerio Noguera brings his record of 19-4 and into the key arena as he meets the undefeated Phil Davis. The 8 no Mr. Wonderful is taking the spot of an injured Tito Ortiz as he headlines his first show against the toughest opponent of his young career. On August 18, 2001, Antonio Rogerio Noguera, the younger brother of former Pride and UFC heavyweight champion Antonio Rodrigo Noguera, made his first foray into mixed martial arts. With Brazilian top team in its corner, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt debuted for the Japanese-based promotion Deep. Throwing out the jab there, and Noguera comes in immediately with some beautiful combinations. A relentless there attack is. by Noguera. High-level Jiu-Jitsu here, and that's what we're yeah. seeing. He'll finish. Noguera He'll finish the knees. Absolutely. Look at the hyperextension. Lil Nog established himself during his tenure in Pride, and it was there that he would defeat the likes of Kazushi Sakuraba, Alistair Overing, and Dan Henderson. Following wins over top contenders, Noguera cemented his spot as one of the greatest 205-pound fighters on the planet. After nine years in the game, the legendary fighter made his way into mainstream North American mixed martial arts. Despite the landscape changing since his days in Pride, he remained a threat. Oh, Noguera now a flush. No oh, is landing the level but trying to throw back. Noguera That's now oh. to the temple with the left. Upon entering the UFC and devastating Louise Kane, he has been scrutinized for lackluster efforts against American wrestlers Jason Brills and Ryan Bader, both representing a new generation of fighters, the athletes. Coming off a contentious decision loss to Bader, the Black House product must once again confront a younger, more athletic, and perhaps even more dangerous combatant in Phil Davis. This Penn State wrestling alumni brings a strong work ethic to the sport. The mindset is don't just win, it's constantly, okay, you know what? You beat him two rounds to none, but really, really put the pressure on him in this third round to break him, you know? And that's just the kind of the mindset I bring into MMA. I try to put an expectation on myself as far as every round, every, every minute, you know, you need to be constantly improving your position and constantly making your case for, you know, a great fight. With an eagerness to improve, the NCAA Division I wrestler already possesses a strong grappling base, which allows him to be creative with his submissions. I don't know, the ground game is just something that just came natural to me. And uh, anything, that I, anything that comes natural to me is going to be my favorite. <laughs> Yeah, if, it, if I, it comes easy to me, I'm going to be really good at it. It's important to be your, your work critic because, you know, well, you, know you, you can't allow someone else to be. The undefeated 26-year-old is comfortable on the ground, but he may opt to use his wrestling to pour on the pressure and control a jiu-jitsu fighter with Noguera's experience. Mr. Wonderful takes a major step in competition, taking on the battle-tested veteran. It's a clash between fighters of different generations where the up-and-coming athlete will be tested against a natural fighter itching to get back to the top. Joining us right now is our top MMA authority slash movie star, John Ramdean, as we look ahead to UFC Fight Night 24. In the main event, Antonio Rogerio Noguera and Phil Davis. We've seen Noguera's problems over his last two fights with Jason Brills, as well as with Ryan Bader. And to me, Phil Davis, the toughest wrestler of those three. Exactly, that's what they have in common, the wrestling. And Phil Davis, one of the best pedigrees in all of mixed martial arts. It's gonna be a very, very tough night for Noguera. As we've seen, the Brazilians don't have the best wrestling in the sport, so he has to rely heavily on his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and he's very competent. I'm sure Phil Davis is going to get this fight down to the ground. It's just how active will Noguera be off of his back? Now, a lot of people tend to be able to look at these pride veterans and think that their best days are behind them. I know you are not one of them when it comes to the Nogueras, and we saw with Noguera in his UFC debut against Luis Kane, solid striking here, and I think that is going to be one of his keys here in this fight. Absolutely, but there is one intangible, and that's the athleticism of each and every one of their opponents. You know, you look at the John Jones against Shogun, just a super athlete, and I think that's the same thing that we have with Phil Davis. This guy's extremely powerful, extremely agile, and faster, and I think that's where it's gonna come into play. I think the speed of Phil Davis will be a factor in this fight. If Noguera can't land early, I think he's gonna be in big trouble. Your pick for Saturday night, Phil Davis and Antonio Rogerio Noguera. Again, 
I never want to pick against the Pride guys, but uh, Phil Davis seems to be on a different level. I don't know if he'll be able to stop him, but I think he'll be powerful enough to control him for three rounds and get the unanimous decision victory, unfortunately for Noguera. 28-year-old Dan Hardy tries to snap a two-fight losing skid as the outlaw will rumble Saturday night with 8-3 Anthony Johnson, who is one of the biggest welterweights in the sport. Johnson has been idle since November of 2009 with knee problems to go along with his constant struggle of making the 170-pound weight limit. Hardy's loss to Carlos Condit at UFC 120 last October was the first time the British-born Hardy has been knocked out in his entire career. All right, for the record, you know, everybody knows I don't like Anthony Johnson. I can't stand him. I really, I really don't like him. And yes, you're going to see this. I can't, I can't stand you. You can't stand me. You know, kiss my ass. Um, honestly, if Anthony's smart because he's wrestling, if he takes Hardy down, Hardy's going to have a bad night. I, I see Anthony winning, winning. You know, if he's smart, if he stands with Hardy, he might be in some serious trouble. But because he does wrestling background, the Hardy's wrestling is not really as good as Anthony's. If everything takes him down, everything will win the fight. I hate to even admit that, but you know, from a viewer standpoint, that's the way I see that fight. Everything Johnson will win that fight. Hardy and Johnson, Mr. Ramdeen, I am predicting this is going to be a catchweight bout as I don't foresee uh, Mr. Johnson coming in at weight or even close to 170. Yeah, unfortunately, that's been his uh, Achilles heel. Uh, Anthony Johnson would be better suited for the 185-pound division, but he feels the need to fight at 170. Uh, Dan Hardy, a very talented guy. I mean, he's got good ground game, but he loves to stand and bang with guys, and I don't know if that's the best game plan going up against Anthony Johnson, who, in my opinion, has superior stand-up skills. And always really interesting when you see fighters, in this case, Dan Hardy, coming off the first knockout of his career against Carlos Condon where he was traded he himself thought he took that fight somewhat lightly and ended up going to sleep against Condon. Yo I'm sure he's not going to take this fight very lightly all you have to do is go back and look at any tape on uh, Anthony Johnson you know what type of talent he is he's very athletic he's versatile and he's a heavy-handed guy so I think Dan Hardy's going to take this fight very seriously but I don't know if it's going to be enough. Your prediction for Saturday night and what weight will Anthony Johnson come in at? I'm going to say 174.5. I think that's not bad, but I think Anthony Johnson will win this fight. I think if he decides to use this wrestling, take this fight down to the ground, he can control Dan Hardy. But if he does decide to keep it standing, I think he can get the knockout as well. But either way, it's going to be Anthony Johnson winning this fight. Tough Season 7 winner Amir Sadal enters the octagon for the seventh time with a 4 and 2 mark to meet another alumnus from the reality show in Season 9 finalist Demarcus Johnson, who comes into this fight with a record of 12 wins and 8 losses. Johnson's last fight came in January where he submitted Mike Guyman, a rare submission with a body triangle, while Sadal a last decision Peter Sabota back in November at UFC 122. On Saturday, we will also see a rematch of what many pegged as the 2010 fight of the year when featherweights Leonard Garcia and Chan Sung Jung trade leather one more time. The 15-6-1 Garcia was scheduled to fight Nam Fan following their controversial bout in December, but with a broken foot sustained by Fan, the 10-3 Korean zombie jumped at the opportunity and took the fight on 10 days' notice. John, we were supposed to see a rematch of Leonard Garcia and Nam Fan on this card. Fan injured his foot, and now in comes the Korean zombie Chan Sung Jung in a rematch of what many consider the fight of the year for 2010. Yeah, and a fight that was more controversial than the Nam Fan fight. Uh, it seems that Leonard Garcia always finds himself in controversial fights. And uh, for this fight, Chan Sung Jung training with Uriah Faber, so maybe he'll abandon the stand-up game and take it right down to the ground where he could be successful. I think you have to use that wild style against Leonard Garcia, and I think the Korean zombie is the guy to do that. If you were advising Leonard Garcia, he's someone with just a tremendously crowd-pleasing style, but at the same time really opens himself up to a, a proficient striker and getting knocked out. What would you be telling Leonard Garcia? Because he's kind of at that periphery where a big appeal to him is his frantic style. Yeah, well, he has to go back and he has to look at the Mark Hominick fight. Mark Hominick, a very technical striker, was able to pick him apart in that fight. So I think he needs to really tighten up his stand-up skills and instead of throwing wildly he has to make every shot count because you know what one loss from Leonard Garcia can send him right to the bottom of the pile. Your pick for Saturday night in this rematch. Again I, I have no idea it's a very close fight but I'm gonna have to say the Korean zombie I think he'll uh, throw a couple new tricks into the game and he'll end up uh, emerging triumphant. We'll take a short break but when we return we'll set our eyes on South Africa for Steve Molitor's IBF junior featherweight title defense this Saturday against Takalani and Lovu and we'll be joined by trainer Chris Johnson. This coming weekend, Steve Molitor is on the road defending his IBF Junior Featherweight Championship in South Africa. 
This Saturday night, the Nasdaq Indoor Arena in Johannesburg, South Africa will play host to an IBF Junior Featherweight Championship bout when title holder Steve Molitor takes his 33-1 record into the hometown of challenger Takalani Lovu, a scrappy 31-6 fighter who has fought Molitor twice before with the title at stake and come up short. IBF Junior Featherweight Champion Steve Molitor will descend upon foreign soil for this Saturday's championship title defense in South Africa, where he meets Johannesburg's Takalani Ndlovu for the third time. This title opportunity came after Ndlovu upset Jeffrey Mathabula in an upset last September. I think maybe Mathabula took him a little bit lightly. I'm not sure what happened there. It doesn't matter to me. I'm a professional. That's what I do. I fight for a living. You know, they came up with the big dollars for me to go over there. So, you know, so be it. Let's do it. For Molitor, going into enemy territory is something he thrives on, having won his first junior featherweight gold, defeating British fighter Michael Hunter in England. I fight better on the road, you know what I mean? There's less pressure, there's less media obligations, there's less, you know, we've got to worry about less about getting tickets for people and making sure your family's taken care of. You know, just go over there, train, relax, let them take care of, all, worry about all that other stuff. Molitor has surrounded himself with lots of help for this camp, including strength and conditioning coach Courtney Shand. Well, in terms of his conditioning, there isn't much to change things for the fight. But in terms of watching this fight, so I've sat with Chris and we've talked about different things that we can incorporate to make Steve better, to make him more efficient with, what, with his style of boxing. Shan contends the biggest issue has been slowing down Molitor's incredible training regimen where he is constantly working to better himself. Boxers in general, their mindset uh, forces them to overtrain just based on the, the thing of I need to do this, I need to do that, I don't want to take a day off. Everything he does is not 100%, it's 250%. So that's been our biggest thing, is trying to temper his training methods that he's already got. Molitor has also enlisted the help of Mark Irwin to handle the business end and put together a solid camp for the champion. We have brought in a lifelong friend of mine, uh, Courtney Shand, who uh, Lennox Lewis is strength and conditioning coach for many, many years and also brought in a kid by the name of Steve Wilcox out of the Hamilton area. Bringing him to uh, the caliber that he needs to be at so that this fight with Lovo is the last fight. I mean, I've been able to focus that much more even on training. I mean, these guys are doing all the, the odds and ends and working with Courtney for my strength and conditionings. And I'm feeling good come fight time. With a third and hopefully final bout with Andlovu this Saturday, there are big plans for Molitor in 2011 from his camp. I believe that uh, Orion Sports, they did an awful lot for Steve. Uh, his All of his fights at Casino Rama. Top ranks can just going to be another, uh, another level. Uh, Bob Arum, one of the smartest guys in, in, in boxing, uh, arguably, is going to take a look after this fight here, and this is just going to catapult Steve into another stratosphere. You know, I, I suggest he's going to Vegas next time around. He's going to be on a big pay-per-view card the world will get to know who Steve Molitor is. Steve Molitor defends the IBF Junior Featherweight Championship this Saturday night in South Africa against Takalani and Glovu. It's our pleasure now to welcome Chris Johnson, the man who will lead IBF Junior Featherweight Champion Steve Molitor into action this Saturday in South Africa. The third go-around for you guys taking on Takalandi and Lovu. And my first question, Chris, is some of the X factors when you guys are going on the road, specifically to another fighter's hometown, and what you have to take into account for Steve heading into this bout. Well, uh, according to the, um, you know, the way the, the fight was arranged to go to South Africa, um, top rank had won the first uh, bid. And, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't even close, the first bid. Top rank had won it, and then they, there was a fault in the bid. And then uh, South Africa came back in and, and the second bid and, and bid an enormous bid. So I believe what they're trying to do, essentially, is to buy that title. They want it in their home country so they can job us. But I just, we've prepared for one thing, Steve Modern and myself and the whole team, Courtney Shan and uh, Mark Irwin, we've pre pre prepared to knock this guy out. And that's what we're gonna do, knock him out. Now, Chris, a lot of people were surprised when this third fight was put together in South Africa. You, though, on the other hand, you have 21 rounds of tape to go look back on. I know you zero in with a lot of critical analysis. What do you take from those first two fights to take into this bout and make sure it's the final fight with Takalani and Lovu? Well, the first fight, uh, we were off the high. We were coming off the high of winning the, the world title. And when you win the world title, you rise another notch, you know, your, your level rise another notch because of the confidence and all, all aspect of that. The second fight, Steve was still uh, repairing, coming off of being uh, beat by Caballero, so a lot of uncertainties were there. Uh, you know, he questioned himself and a lot of the things when he was in that ring. Now, you've got to realize that if, af after every fight after uh, um, losing to Caballero, he's got increasingly better. 
So now we're at the point now where he got, he's so much better than he was the last fight with Takalani, and he even hurt Takalani about three times uh, in the last fight and couldn't capitalize on it. Now we know what we have to do. Now we're more confident than ever that we can knock him out of there. We can knock him out. So when we go there, we are not going for Yunnan's decision or a split decision. We won't get it. We're going there for a knockout. Something unique for this camp is that you've brought in strength and conditioning guru Courtney Shand, who has worked for years with Lennox Lewis. What has Shand brought into this camp preparing Steve for this fight? You know, you, you can't buy experience. This man uh, I grew up with in Kitchener, and he worked alongside Lennox Lewis for 20-some-odd years, uh, running his training camps, uh, doing his strength and conditioning. So the amount of experience and knowledge he picked up is immense along the way. And to bring that to a camp like, uh, like Steve Mahler, it's immense. I, I no longer have to do everything. You know, he's there motivating Steve. He's there pushing Steve. And, you know, just even with myself, he's telling me a little bit of the experience that he got. So it's helping me along the way, too. And more than that, he's a friend. It's just, it's an awesome, awesome and powerful team. And finally, Chris, as we head into this bout on Saturday, is there any bad blood that has developed between Molitor and Enlovu? We saw after the second fight that Enlovu was very vocal about the judging in the fight and feeling that he won the bout. And you guys were very vocal at that post-fight press conference. Tell us about that heading into this fight. Well, you got to realize something. This man traveled uh, hundreds of thousands of miles to come to Canada the first time and got knocked out in the ninth round and he was a number one contender he got knocked out in the ninth round so now he comes back and he goes a 12 round he goes 12 rounds with the champion he didn't get knocked out so when you don't get knocked out you believe that the fight was closer than it actually was because in your mindset you had already given yourself the the, the loss you already knew you were going to get knocked out and he didn't get knocked out so what, what does he have to hold on to? Oh, thank you, it was a close fight. Well, this time, we are going to write a story right. We're going to knock him out. So then, therefore, there will be no talk from Takalani. Well, Chris, we wish you the best of success this Saturday night, the third fight with Takalani and Lovu in Johannesburg, South Africa, and we always appreciate your time. Thank you so much, John, and I love the fight network, and I love the fact that you guys are interviewing me at Kim Jim, where champions are made here, too. So thank you guys very much for following us, and uh, we hope that we will bring the title back home. This Saturday night, Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey, will see 19-0 WBA and IBF featherweight champion Yuri Yorkis Gamboa defend his gold against 42-2 Mexican Jorge Solis. Solis last fought at super featherweight for his last two bouts, but returns to 126 pounds for this title opportunity. Gamboa last fought in September, earning a unanimous nod over Orlando Salido. 29-year-old IBF and WBA featherweight champion Yuri Orcas Gamboa puts it all on the table at Boardwalk Hall this Saturday with his 126-pound gold and undefeated record on the line when he meets 42-2 Mexican fighter Jorge Solis. Gamboa, an Olympic gold medalist for Cuba, burst onto the scene in April of 2007, earning his first major championship only two years and 15 fights into his professional career. Gamboa comes to finish fights, stopping 15 of his 19 opponents with his past two fights being the first time he's gone a full 12 rounds. Target practice for the Cyclone of Guantanamo. Solis may only be two years his senior, but has close to a decade more of experience, making his pro debut in February of 1998, with his most high-profile bout taking place in April of 2007, where he fought Manny Pacquiao in a losing effort. This Saturday night, it's an opportunity for Solis to cement his legacy in the weight class. But in doing so, he will have to harness the strong hands and speed of the undefeated champion, who is yet to meet his match amongst the featherweight ranks. When we come back, it's a look at the start of Bellator's Season 4 Light Heavyweight Tournament to crown their inaugural 205-pound champion. Don't go anywhere as the Fight Network's preview show continues. It's Bellator 38 Saturday night. That means the start of another tournament. This time, it's the Light Heavyweights who will be on display. The light heavyweight tournament kicks off this Saturday night at Bellator 38 with eight men vying for the $100,000 prize and the opportunity to become Bellator's inaugural light heavyweight champion. IFL and Pride veteran Daniel Gracie enters the tournament in just his second fight in the last four years as he takes on undefeated Balance Studios pupil Tim Carpenter. 
Gracie will look to get this fight to the mat quickly as the fourth degree Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt has four submission victories in just eight pro bouts. Deep in M1 Global veteran Christian Mpambu goes to war with headhunter MMA product Chris Davis. Mpambu, who holds a win over UFC heavyweight Stefan Struve, will likely not stand in trade with Davis, who does possess knockout power. Davis, meanwhile, has two blemishes on his record, both first round submission losses to UFC veterans Jeremy Horn and Vinny Magalesh, and will want to avoid Mpambu's jiu jitsu. 8 and 1 DJ Linderman faces off against 10 and 1 Rafael Davis. Davis made an impressive Bellator debut in season 2, stopping Demetrius Richards in the first round. Davis is considered by many pundits to be the tournament favorite and will likely rely on his wrestling pedigree, which he used in his win against Tony Lopez at Bellator 34. And in the night's opening bout, undefeated Extreme Couture product Nick the Machete Facchetti tangles with 15-3-1 Richard Rarebreed Hale. While boasting a win over Strikeforce rising star Ovin St. Pru, the Machete has only fought four times and will have an experienced disadvantage against Hale, who is comfortable anywhere the fight goes. All the action kicks off this Saturday night from the Harris Tunisa Hotel and Casino, live on MTV2. John, we're going to see the light heavyweight tournament kick off this weekend. One of the opening round competitors is going to be Daniel Gracie, a 38-year-old who was pretty inactive because of an elbow injury, returning last November at the Israel Fighting Championships. Yeah, he's taking on a very tough guy in Tim Carpenter. There's no denying uh, Gracie's jiu-jitsu skills. I mean, that's, what he, that's his bread and butter. He trains with Henzo Gracie, so clearly he wants to get this fight down to the ground. But Tim Carpenter, also a Gracie jiu-jitsu practitioner with awesome base and big heavy hands. I think if this fight does go down to the ground, expect Carpenter to nail Gracie. Oh, very nice. Yeah. We're also going to see French import Christian Mpambu, who's a veteran of both the Deep promotion and M1 Global. What can you tell us about Mpambu as one of the voices of Deep? Yeah, I think this guy really will be one of the favorites to win this entire tournament. Awesome stand-up skills, great conditioning, and a very versatile ground game. Expect him to win by some form of choke in the first round. It's stage one this coming weekend as Bellator seeks to crown their first ever light heavyweight champion. Tons of action this coming weekend. As we mentioned, Steve Molitor defending his IBF junior featherweight title in South Africa. UFC fight night is taking place in Seattle. Tons of action for you all to catch and we hope you enjoy all of the fights. On behalf of everyone here at Extreme Couture Toronto, our staff here at the Fight Network, John Ramdeen, I'm John Pollock, and we wish all of you a fun weekend. That's it, Phil, good. Grip, rip, boom. Rip. Nice. Oh, he's just landing the lever, but Dewey's trying to pull back. No guarantee. Oh, oh. To the temple with the left. 